What's going on, guys? Welcome to another episode of Eastern Current. Got Mike on here tonight, and we're going to talk about the importance of starting to fish deep this time of year in August. Not and deep is a relative term. You know, it can mean a lot of different things. But but uh, the, a lot of these fish, the redfish are still getting shallow. But a lot of these fish, especially with the mullet moving and the warmer water, are, are finding deeper areas or areas closer to deep water to hang out, uh, to do their feeding, to do their loafing if you will um so we're going to kind of share some stuff that we've learned and we found that's been productive for us um before we get into that i want to thank i strike fishing a sponsor of this show um pin uh as well as fenwick um great supporters of the show um and just always want to thank them definitely go check out um us on instagram eastern current fishing you can check out michael's instagram at the yellow fury 18 uh, you can check out my Instagram, Judd Brock Fishing. Uh, you can check out Eastern Current Fishing on Facebook. Uh, if you listen to the podcast side of things, definitely come check out our YouTube channel. There's a lot of extra content on there. We also have a Patreon page. It's got extra content on there. Uh, we really focus on answering your questions well on that page, um, doing some videos and some other extra content over there. So definitely go check that out as well if you do want to help support us here uh, on, at Eastern Current. So we put a lot of time in, and we're just very thankful for those that, that are that are helping out on that side of things. Um, but that is enough uh, of the pre-show ramble. We're going to get right into it. I'm going to bring on our guest, Michael Bell. Not guest, just another part of Eastern Current. But uh, what's up, man? Not much. How are you tonight? Good. It's been a minute since we've done a podcast. I know. Our busy. lives have been a little crazy here lately. <laughs> no, it's been super crazy, super super crazy. But I'm glad we're able to to get after it tonight. So, um, but yeah, thanks for coming on. Thanks for chatting with us again. For those of y'all that haven't uh, met Mike on a previous podcast, he's he's my good buddy. We met in college, fished together. We really learned a lot of the inshore fishing here. Kind of took our inshore fishing to the next level with each other, as far as you know, having someone that that had the drive and desire to really learn. Uh, what to do here so that kind of uh, the fire was lit well before college but um, college kind of gave us the time and the freedom um, to to be able to spend probably more time than we should have on the water Um, (laughs) more time than we did in the classrooms yeah probably so probably so that might be why i never finished school but um that's to be to be determined or maybe to never be determined um but uh let's get into it so um like i was saying at, at the beginning um, this time of year is is um, not not to write off shallow water, but the deeper stuff can become so productive. Um, you know, stuff along the waterways, the deeper pockets and creeks. Um, you know, deep docks, the tips of the docks. You know, maybe not up shallow on the docks. Um, stuff like jetties, and this is in any area that you are. Like we're seeing here in North Carolina, eighty five degree water temp, um, and you know that that kind of shuts the bite down shallow for a lot of stuff you know as the day gets going the trout the redfish and the flounder they'll you can still catch them all shallow in that heat but sometimes you can find a more productive bite deeper and, and i don't think just because it's a hot day you should just fish deep but it's something that you should be thinking about if the shallow stuff's not working out um so why don't you share we'll start out mike share a little bit about like kind of your thoughts on water depth um this time of year and, and water temperature and kind of how that all plays together I kind of break mine down with tides and time of day. Um, a lot of times, like, I'm focusing on deep water, like you said, deep creeks uh, or pockets and creeks and stuff is kind of the focus for this time of year. Yeah. But um, if I'm going to fish sa- shallow or look for fish, especially redfish and flounder in that, you know, two to three foot of water, I'm targeting a lot of that time on the first of the incoming tide or if the water's low first thing in the morning where it's the coolest. Um, those are going to be the two times that I kind of focus on those areas. Um, something about the first bit of that incoming tide, I think it's just, a you know, that water is set, especially during the, you know, the heat of the day, if the low tide's in the middle of the day, it gets that just super warm, baked, and the least amount of water that they have in the creeks. The mud banks are hot. So as that water starts to come up, um, you know, it gets real warm right up against the banks, but those fish will push out just a little bit off the banks in that two to three foot section. And that cool water coming in um, is where they kind of tend to stay at, I feel like. So that's kind of how I start breaking it down. And then from there, um, it just kind of depends on what I'm looking for target wise. You know, redfish and stuff, I'm 
you know, maybe five, six foot as far as deep as I'm going, um, and you know, the deeper pockets. But if I'm finding something deeper than that, that's typically where I'm getting my trout and that kind of stuff. Yeah. So it, I like that, man. It's it, it really is can be so species dependent, and and each day can be different. And one thing that that I really see this time of year is the shallow water fishing, like that that incoming tide really seems to fire fish up because I think it's bringing a lot of that that fresh water and that falling tide it's taken a lot of that water that's set way back up in the creeks in that shallow water and, and warmed it up and made it real hot and that's all falling out uh, but on the incoming yeah. tide you've got that that cooler fresh you know not fresh but cooler um, you know new water coming in out of the ocean kind of pushing in and cooling things off so uh, I think that, that that's a big factor of why those fish start to especially the redfish will push up shallow and, and fishing deep you know we're, we're talking about a lot of that near shore structure, um, jetties, not just inshore. Kind of, you know, yeah. th- this time of year is a is a great time of year to fish off the beach a little bit and inshore. You know, really play your tides. If you kind of push yourself to learn how to fish off the beach, how to fish the jetties, how to fish some of the, you know, the surf zone stuff as well from a boat, um, you can have a lot of options that can be very productive. Um, in, in a short window in, or in a long window, but like I can go on a four hour trip and go catch fish in the ocean, you know, on the jetty and then inshore and, and kind of move around a bunch, show people a lot of water um, and keep it interesting for me too. It keeps me on my toes when I'm moving around and, and whatnot. Um, but, but let's talk, uh, a, let's kind of get into redfish's habits first off. Cause I, you know, that's kind of our, our forte. Um, and I feel like a lot of people's favorite, fish to target or you know people that are learning or maybe tuning into this podcast the redfish has is is a highly kind of sought after fish to go to go catch in our areas you know from georgia up to virginia um so what would you say what would you say is the is the number one driving factor of what a redfish is doing right now this time of year i know this could be like completely like personal like not personal preference but like i don't know if there's a right answer to this but i'm wondering what you think it might be yeah, so I think this time of year, I mean, mullet's kind of everywhere. Um, but I think there are certain areas, especially in the marsh, that I've noticed that hold, like, more shrimp and different stuff like that. Um, especially I see the, the redfish themselves feeding on shrimp, popping shrimp, pushing it down the bank, that kind of stuff. Um, so I think kind of their ability to have more than one type of food source Um is a little bit of a factor this time of year. And then um, I think where they don't have to expend a ton of energy. Yeah. Um, Because, you know. Because it's so hot. It's so hot. Expending energy in the heat. Like, we don't like doing it. Yeah. Humans don't. Yep, exactly. And, you know, they look for either cooler places to sit, if they can, you know, whether it's underneath a dock or something like that, or – If they can find somewhere that's got a little bit slower current where they don't have to move as much, you know, to stay in one spot, whatever it is. Um, And then two bottom types, I think, play a little bit of a role in that, especially during that really shallow water time um, of the lower tides. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Um, uh, I've shared this maybe on the podcast before, so I apologize. I can never remember if I've shared it on the guide trip or the podcast. I can't quite keep up. Um, But... Redfish and Mike, this is actually a story that includes you. Um, okay. <laughs> well, it's not even a story, but it's just just some some cool facts. Like I just always share with clients, like how cool a fish or how cool of a fish the redfish is because of how hardy it is. I've had you know I've seen redfish belly crawling and busting shrimp in a foot deep creek that that re, that I don't know on my graph it was reading it was ninety four degrees. I think it was ninety two degrees the water temperature. Mm-hmm. Um, it was like late August, super hot, just dead still. We'd had like seven or eight burning hot days in a row. And those fish were getting their backs out and blowing shrimp up on the bank. And me and Michael were down in Louisiana the first time we ever went down there. And we pull up into this little cove, and there's a couple redfish cruising in about a foot of water. And I think it was you that threw the fly to him. Yep. So Mike throws the fly to him. Dumbbell eyes, like lead eyes. Perfect cast, lands out in front of them a couple feet, across their path a couple feet. Like, you know, sometimes when you throw a fly, like if it's not fully wet, it won't sink right off the bat, so you got to kind of strip it once or twice. 
to get it to sink and Mike's like stripping it and it's just sliding across the surface of the water and he, I'm like pick it up and go again and cast again and same deal happens and then the fish we realize we're under ice yep. and then they swam out from underneath the ice and Mike threw the fly to him and they ate it so you know water that's essentially 32 degrees to water that's 94 92 degrees I mean that's a huge swing I'm not a math guy I'm not going to tell you how big of a difference that is um, I'm just kidding but just to see that those fish can survive in that. Like there's very few fish that, that are flats fish that you can target in shallow water and sight fish for. I don't think there's an, any other one. I mean, I think the redfish is the only flats fish that can survive that, you know, big of a temperature change. Yeah. Am I missing yeah. one? You think? I mean, no. let's just call it a flounder, mm. but flounder, to, well, you're not, it's not a sight fish targeted flat fish. I don't, yeah, yeah it's not a flats no. fish. It is a flat fish, but it's not a flats fish. Um, golly, man, that the the I've been trying so hard to upgrade my flounder for this tournament that I'm fishing right now, and I cannot do it. Um, I don't want to get into that though. Get into the flat fish thing, but um, what do you what do you would would you say is the the main food source for these redfish this time of year? Because I will say and. You know, I've kind of questioned if it's because. So I'll say it first. So when I clean fish, whenever I clean redfish, I always, really any fish, I like to cut their stomach open and see what they've been eating. Um, I just feel like it helps me be more aware of why they were where they are were and and you know what I might be able to do differently to, to catch them better. And every redfish I ever cut open, whether it's you know winter time, spring time, summer, fall, it's like the majority of what's in their stomach is crabs. Blue crabs, mud crabs. You don't see fiddler crabs as much, but they can't access those on a regular basis. So I really don't think that. Or I really think that's why. But mostly little small blue crabs and mud crabs, and and stone like baby stone crabs you'll see in there as well. Um, and you will see fish, and you will see. I can't say I've ever seen a, a shrimp in a redfish's stomach, but. Uh, and, and my question is, do you? Th- this is just a. This doesn't really matter. But do you think that's because they're eating that way more? Or do you think that's because the crab, that hard shell and everything, kind of holds up in its stomach a little bit longer, so you're seeing that more often than you are the bait fish? Because a lot of times you'll see like a, you know, you can't it really tell what kind of fish it is, but it's like obviously it was a mullet or like a, you know, a spot or something like that. Um, but what, what's your opinion on that? I think it's a little bit of both. Um, definitely seeing that crab, you know crab shells and all that kind of stuff last a lot longer the stomach isn't really able to break it down as well right. it's more of the action of them actually you know like constricting their stomach and breaking the shell down mechanically versus chemically yeah if that makes sense instead of like digesting it um but at the same time i think too a lot of it has to do with ease of access you know you think about a redfish i mean it's primary focus of the way it eats is pointing down the way its mouth set up the way its eyes are set up that kind of thing you know so i think a lot of times you know their focus as much as they are on like eating mullet and that kind of stuff Uh that's more of an opportunistic thing i feel like than it is more of like kind of what they're driven to eat yeah i would agree i know i would totally agree you know i think they do like to take advantage of mullet when they're there but it's not always it's not always it's like they're constantly eating crabs when they can get themselves in a position to eat mullet and stuff like that they do Um, i mean you think about a top water like i know this time of year my top water fishing springtime fall time pretty quick action you know i know the water's cool enough they're gonna chase it this time of year i mean it is a slow paced walk and you know i can fish that up till 10 11 o'clock in the middle of the day and still get them to eat a top water but it's, I believe, because it's presented very slowly in an easy manner where, you know, they're being opportunistic and can take advantage of it. Yeah. Um, yeah, they want an easy meal right, right now. There's so much, yeah. so many options in the water. Everything that they eat is, is around right now. And so they'll, they'll kind of take yeah. advantage of it. And then there's, like, that, that swing time of when, like, stuff's starting to disappear, but they still eat it really heavily. And then you'd think, like, in the winter, but I guess because it's so cold and they slow way down, but... You get those warm days in the winter, though, and there's like there's no mullet around, but you throw a topwater. You, sometimes you can't get them to eat a jig. You can't even eat anything. You throw a topwater, and they'll start <laughs> smacking a topwater. Um, but, you know, that, that's a whole other whole other topic there. Um, d- is there a specific depth that you see that these fish seem to be a little more active at in the summer? Um, 
Because right now I'm catching fish in anything from 35 feet of water, you know, even inshore, 35 feet of water, um, yep. to a foot of water. But but the Sprint. consistent bites I'm getting on, um, and, and this is bait fishing, as opposed to pitching a bait up to the bank, or this is, you know, in, in the deeper water, it's always bait fishing. Like, I, you can jig redfish in deep water, but it's just guiding. It's a hard thing to get people um, to do correctly quick enough to, like, really make it happen. But, um, man, some of that stuff from, like, 5 feet to, to 15, 18 feet has been, you know, very productive in shore. Yo, I was going to say, I think it has a lot to do with how you want to fish. Bait fishing and stuff, like you said, I mean, I'm targeting docks from 8 to 10 feet of water and deeper if I can find it. Um, and sometimes that's tide dependent. And then, you know, if I'm throwing artificial, whether it's top water or jigs, I'm sticking in 2 to 4 foot of water. You yeah. know, something a little shallower than that is, you know first thing in the morning or if the tide's first starting to push in like we've already talked about where there's you know it's cooler and those fish will move up into it but even in the heat of the day i'm moving off you know three four foot of water somewhere around there if i'm going to be throwing artificials for sure for sure it's uh it's it's funny like and i I, we've talked about this before but we could have four different dudes on here and we could all have slightly different opinions but and it also kind of depends on what's working for you right now and what's working for me right now um, yeah. but, but because of, you know, the vast amount of different bait and the vast amount of, you know, or the, the warm water temperature everywhere, you know, it puts these fish in a lot of places, um, which, which is, I think good, you know, being able to check a bunch of stuff and try a bunch of different things. Um, but it is, you know, we're kind of starting to get into that transition time where these fish, you know, we're going to have a mullet run, you know, there's going to be a big change on what these fish are doing, where they're hanging out. We're about to start to see some bigger fish inshore, some bigger fish near shore. Um, yep. So, so that's always exciting. Um, what about flounder and trout? Like, what do you really see? Or let's talk about trout first, because trout is definitely very um, specific. Or, or I think, you know, time of day and water temperature plays a lot into their activity. Um, so, so what's your take on, on summertime trout fishing? For summertime like heat, trout fishing. Like hot, fishing. hot heat summertime trout fishing. Yeah, most of my time, you know, I'm focusing first thing in the morning. That's going to be kind of that first, like, two hours of light is most of my focus time um, to be able to catch them in shallower than four to five feet of water. Past that, it's going to be bait fishing or jig heads, and I'm focusing in 10 to 12 feet of water. Yeah. Um, You know, and... Even then, a lot of times, the bite is really, really slow in that depth of water. Yeah. yeah so. that, that's kind of what I see, too, this time of year. Like, like early summer, you, I, I catch them all, all uh, day on a soft plastic. Uh, but yeah. this time of year, it seems like that morning bite. And you'll catch, you'll hook some fish in the middle of the day for sure. Especially if you, like, really just went out and you're like, I'm just going to hit a bunch of trout stuff and just trout fish. Like, you're going to catch some fish in the middle of the day, but that peak bite is going to be early. And those fish, a lot of times, they're looking for a big meal because they're just going to lay, like, sit sit all day. So throwing a big top water right first thing in the morning uh, for the first hour can be productive. But, that, you know, that, that golden hour, that first thing in the morning, same as in the, in the evening, it's like there's always so many things, that, at least for me, I want to do. Um, and especially with clients, it's hard to be like, all right, let's go, you know, see if we can ca- catch a couple big trout on top water when we could maybe yeah. be, you know, having a little bit more success with redfish. Um, but yeah, I'm with you. Those fish, they do like to slide off into some deeper water, sit in some deeper pockets and whatnot. Uh, and I'll still be surprised though, in the middle of the summer, like you will ha- catch one that slips up and, and it, you know, eat, I, don't, I wouldn't say slips up, but they'll be up there shallow eating mullet or blowing mullet up. I think it's ladyfish, but some of those trout will sit up, so, so still sit up pretty shallow if you can get after it early in the morning. Yeah. And I think it a lot has to do with kind of your location too. Like, a lot of our trout are migratory that we get throughout the year, especially the fall and the winter trout that we right. get are you know, trout that come down here from up north, um, whether that's Chesapeake Bay or Pamlico, those kind of areas, and they move south for the winter. Um, but, you know, I mean, if you're down in Florida and you're looking at, they're catching trout in two foot of water in Indian River and Mosquito Lagoon in the heat of summer, you know. So I think a lot of it has to kind of do with a little bit of, situationalism yeah for sense. sure 
um, we have enough deep water changes to where those fish can really move and migrate within the marsh system to get to that deeper water. Um, and they take advantage of it, whereas, you know, farther south in some of those areas, they don't. So it might be something as small as a one foot, two foot change, depending on the area that you're in, um, might be all that they're looking for. Definitely. And there's a, there, I've kind of realized there's a myth for a lot of people, not a myth, but a lot of people think that trout like cooler weather and it's not that they necessarily, uh, you know, a, a lot of fish get very lethargic in the heat of summer. Uh, redfish, trout flounder, everything we're talking about. But, but I've heard people say, you know, like, oh, you know, trout, they like that colder water. Um, and it's really, that's not the case. Those fish are pushing south to get away from cold water. Like, they're trying to move south. That Chesapeake Bay range is, like, the, the northernmost. Like, where you're going to get those freezes, if you get a couple days of, you know, freeze, it kills those fish. To where, like, redfish, they could, they're a little hardier. They can withstand that for a little while. Um but but those trout they're trying to put themselves in a safe place for the winter where there is going to be one food but two water that they can make it through um yeah. and so it's not necessarily like cold water it's a, that they want to keep themselves in in a little bit warmer water as it get, as things start to cool off um so and with that being said that's why you start to catch them if you're going to catch them in the middle of the day here you're catching a little bit deeper water um and we could get into like thermocline and all that stuff, but I think it's 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 a little much to really worry about, you know. Yeah, but I was actually sitting here thinking the same thing. I was like, well, we could, but yeah, yeah, yeah it, it's over my head even. So it's something like I like to think about and act like I I know what I'm I'm really talking about, and that maybe some days I do, but um, <laughs> but yeah, just just kind of finding that that depth for the morning time and kind of finding that depth for the evening and. And those, a lot of times, they're not like swimming to a completely different area, but if you're catching them up tight on a point on the bank, you know, early in the morning, pull off and fish, you know, throw, throw that bait 20 feet off the bank and let it get down deep. And, and a lot of times that's where those fish are. They're going to put themselves yep. uh, in, in those areas. So um, what kind of, you know, when you're fishing a little bit deeper water for trout, is there any specific soft plastic that you like to use? Um, Not really. I mean, I stick to... This year, I haven't, I mean, there's definitely some big mullet around. We always talk about looking at big baits and that kind of stuff, but, or we have in the past. This year, I mean, there's some bigger mullet here, but a lot of our mullet have been on the smaller side, I would say, still for the year. Um, so this year, I've been really focusing more on that, like, four-inch bait um, and, you know, whatever whatever paddle tell, um, but definitely going with something a little more natural this time of year too yeah, for sure so for sure and we've got some dirtier water here in north Carolina. i think a lot of the east coast has seen a lot of rain lately um darkening that color up too for trout and for redfish uh as well as flounder. like i do like to fish a lot of white especially for flounder uh, mm -hmm. but but a darker profile in that in that water i feel like it kind of silhouettes a little bit better in the darker water and those fish pick up on it uh, so that that's something to think about as well uh, what weight jig head did you say that what weight jig head do you like to bounce uh, this time of year if you're fishing artificials probably three sixteenths to a quarter yeah is kind of the range I like to stay in so yeah it depends on probably it's, current and depth and everything yeah but I would say for the most part that's kind of the that's kind of my go to all the time for kind of our marsh area here yeah. um, definitely there's certain situations that I change out you know, if I'm fishing close to the inlet and got way more current or something, I might step it up. But um, that's kind of the good general term of where I stay at. Thank you. Um, well, I think flounder is another one that, you know, and I always, you know, I end up fishing deep throughout the day. But I, I'm, like I said at the beginning of this, a lot of these fish will still be shallow too. But it's good to have, this is, this is the time of day that you really see it play in. You know, one day you're catching fish really shallow, seeing them relaxed active shallow, and then the next day you go back and, like, those redfish aren't belly crawling those banks. The flounder aren't blowing baits up, you know, on the edge, and that's when they're they're sitting further off the bank. So not that this is, like, you know, the end-all, be-all of how you can catch fish in the summer, but fishing that deeper stuff, taking some time if you never fished deeper stuff to learn some areas or to feel confident pulling off the bank and fishing a little bit deeper um, can help you on those days where you're struggling and those fish aren't, you know, where you're typically finding them shallow. So it's definitely been helping me lately. Um, but that is a tough thing to do. Like it's so easy as a fisherman to like 
throw it up to the bank. Like it gives you a specific ending point for your cast, but it's like a specific target every cast. Um, and yeah. some of the hardest stuff to do, like when I started fishing in Louisiana, is really when I, I got better at that because those bigger fish, they're not usually, they'll get right up on the bank sometimes. But like you'll pull up into a pocket or a pond in the marsh, and those big fish, you can pull the edge and, and get shots at little, at, you know, slot fish all day. And you're like, God, there's no big fish in there. But the, usually the big fish are sitting out in the middle. And so, you know, learning how to, how to think like a fish and, and know where a fish based off of its size might be, know where a fish based off of the water temperature and the depth might be. Um, those things, you know, take the drive and desire to maybe struggle for a little while to learn those um, points. And, and you can sit and listen to as many podcasts, as many YouTube videos as you want. But you got to get out there and, and do it, and you also have to do it enough to where you build that confidence. Because if you don't build that confidence, eventually you're going to pull away from that and and not keep doing it. But um, you know, it's it's worth trying some deeper stuff. Like if you if you're going out this weekend, dedicate half your trip to to trying to fish some deeper stuff. So um, that's kind of kind of my two cents on on, on it. Like it, it can be intimidating for sure. Definitely. I think, too, a lot of people, either they have a graph or they don't really use their graph because they're like, oh, I'm in five foot of water. You know, I don't need my graph. But take time when you're out, you know, going between spots and you cross through some areas of deeper water. Sit there and look at your graph. It could be something as small as a little oyster mound, a little sandbar, you know, just a little ledge of some, of some sort. Yeah that creates enough of a piece of structure for those fish to sit on you know and you don't have to fish it for an hour you know put a mark on it back up sit there give it 15 20 casts if you don't do anything no big deal move on but always remember that in the back of your head you know okay next time i come by give that a few shots yeah for sure for sure so because a lot of times these fish, we're talking about, you know, time of day, we're talking about water temperature and the tide movement. It might be something as simple as you were there an hour too early or an hour too late for that tide cycle or that day for those fish to be sitting there. Yeah. So. No, I'm with you on that. Um, and one thing that has helped me a lot, and this is going back into flounder, um, to learn where to flounder fish inshore has been polling. Uh, yep. You know, when I spook those fish off those shallow banks early in the morning in that low light, they're sitting in two inches of water, four inches of water, five inches of water, uh, and remembering where those fish were laying. Because, you know, I can go back in there and target them in that shallow water, but also, you know, a little bit later in the day, I can fish for a little bit further off that bank and pick those fish up. I mean, those fish, a lot of the fish this time of year are just sliding, you know, up and down, up and down uh, off those banks, you know, instead of cruise in that shallow water. Um, they're kind of sliding in, out into deep water, hanging out, coming up, feeding, dropping back off into deep water. I'm seeing it with a lot of the redfish in the river. Um, you're not getting that uh, in a lot of scenarios, the belly crawling as much. You're still getting that a lot, but you're getting a lot of fish that are starting to just blast up, blow something up, and drop off the bank, which are like very hard fish to target sight fishing. Uh, but they're sitting in that, in that deeper stuff, still feeding shallow because that's where those mullet are. That's where the shrimp are. That's where a lot of those crabs are. Um, but but not getting far from that deep water uh, so it's uh it's a it's a fun time here to fish but it can it, it's like you can have a, a bomb day and then a butt kicker the next day so yeah that's uh it can be tough but i'm trying to think um let's talk a, l- a little bit we're, we'll, we'll wrap this one up we're gonna do a little bit shorter podcast tonight but let's talk a little bit about you know how some of these fish based off of the water temperature um, sit out in the ocean and how this can be a good time here to, to fish the ocean. Um, Mike and I had this past Sunday, we went out with our buddy Kenny um, and did some fishing. I had a bunch of flounder, a bunch of gray trout, uh, a bunch of redfish in the ocean, um, just hopping mullets on the bottom. Um, and in some areas that I have not, I've been trying, but with no success, you know, even three, four weeks ago, a lot of these fish are starting to move out to that stuff. And I don't know if they move out to it or they move from the north south or from the south north, like you know, as far as the the big bigger redfish go, because um, you know I feel and and it makes me think like maybe those fish were all inshore but still fit, sitting deep, like stuff that I'm not hitting, stuff that I'm not trying. But you'll get these schools right. of like you know 28 inch to 35 inch redfish, not bulls, but you know definitely over slots. 
hanging out together out there. Uh, what do you think? Do you, you think it's water temperature that's a big part of the factor of why those fish are sitting deep out there in the ocean as opposed to coming in shore? Yeah. Sorry about the background noise there. No, you're kidding. Okay. Um, I think a lot of it has to do with water temperature, but I think it also has to do with this time of year um, and the moon phases that we're coming up on because yeah. it's about to be spawning time for our redfish here in North Carolina coming up, you know, September, October. Um, and I think we're seeing a lot of this is kind of their, like, pre-congregation time, I believe. Um, and I think that's part of it. But um, water temperature, you know, they're going to drop out of this hotter water. As we were talking earlier, you know, they can't move up and feed and stay exactly where they want to be at, these bigger fish, mm-hmm. um, in the marsh where they're being so hot. And then so much competition also from the other flounder, redfish, trout, and stuff that's in shore. So I think a lot of times they move out, it's, you know, they can sit down on the bottom, it's cool. They don't have to expend a whole lot of energy because there's not a ton of current unless, you know, they can slide behind some piece of structure. And then, you know, there's a lot of bait out there right now. I mean, there's bait from right off the beach and in the marsh to, you know, five, ten miles off pretty consistently. Um, So it gives them a wide range of stuff to target. For sure, for sure. Um, No, I couldn't couldn't have said that any better. That deeper water this time of year, um, you know, in the ocean, I think a lot of those fish are, like you said, spawning. Um, A lot of those fish are... um, you know, out there because it's deeper and, and there's less, you know, less, sorry, less, uh, um, I don't even know what I was saying, but the, <laughs> those, fi- those fish get deep in the ocean for quite a few reasons. Spawning is a big one for sure. Water temperature, I think is, we also had a lot of rain recently, which pushed a lot of those fish out, um, you know, under our jetties and, and some of our, our near shore structure. So, um, it, it, that is another intimidating way to fish because like, I remember when I was trying to learn to fish the ocean, uh, for redfish and flounder and whatnot, it, you know, it's a lot of sea bass, a lot of oyster toads. And so you kind of really pick up those little nuances of, you know, how to fish on the edge of structure and where those fish, you know, lay in relation to structure. Um, and, and fishing vertically, you know, is a lot of what we do in the ocean, but there's a lot of places, deeper water that you can do that inshore. Uh, it's kind of overlooked, you know, but um, one thing that me and Mike were talking about the other day, is like we were fishing in 28 feet of water or something like that. And it sounds yeah. deep, but then you think about your boat. We're sitting on that on my twenty two Pathfinder, and yeah, you know that's only twenty, or I guess twenty two. You know, feet is it's a little bit more than a boat length away from the fish when you're sitting there um, targeting those fish and in, in twenty eight feet of water. Um, so being quiet and being being stealthy, you know, if you're fishing that near shore stuff, uh, I like to. You know, there's certain areas where you don't have to do this, but um, if you're the first one up to a piece of bottom or, or whatnot, you know, killing your motor a little ways out and drifting in or trolling motoring in, I don't think it can ever hurt, uh, especially if you're targeting redfish on that stuff. Flounder, I don't think it really affects, you know, sheep's head and, and stuff like that. Tog, I don't think it affects as much. Maybe I'm wrong. If I'm wrong, let me know in the comments. Um, but, but definitely with redfish, I think you can shut a bite down by, you know, cranking your motor on, turning it off, cranking it on, turning it off, moving the boat around a lot. So like, I try to take advantage of the wind, use my trolling motor to drift around if I can, uh, or to troll around if I can, um, because that, you know, 28 feet is not that far away from me. 30 feet is not that far away from me. It's 10 feet further than a, you know, 20 foot boat. So when you think about it like that, you're standing on the back of your boat, looking at the bow, you're like, oh, that's way, way closer than it, than it feels. And I'm dropping my one ounce weight down at the bottom. Um, but that's a fun way to kind of get away from people, get away from, you know, it depends on where you fish, but. Um, get away from that inshore grind this time of year and pick up on some some trout and some redfish and some flounder out there. Um, get your get you ready for flounder season. Practiced up. Yep. <laughs> uh, I'll say too. I mean, it gives you a lot more species availability too. I mean, sure. bluefish out there. Like you said, you're talking about sheep's head. A lot of different stuff. Um, you know, and taking advantage of different baits different types of baits like we were talking about crabs and different stuff like Mm -hmm. that earlier you know this is a great time of year along with the dead of winter to you know try something different you know shrimp isn't going to last long with all the pinfish that we have right now but whether it's blue crab mud crabs that kind of stuff this is a great excuse me great time of year to start taking advantage of that yeah most definitely most definitely Well, well guys 
We hope that uh, this was helpful. I think we're going to probably try to do, you know, a little more focus on this, you know, fishing this time of year, the, you know, where these fish are hanging out, how to target them. Uh, and maybe next week we'll get more into um, exactly how we like to target these fish in deeper water. You know, we kind of, this week was about showing and, and encouraging you to go try some deeper stuff. And we'll share a little bit more about our techniques um, here coming up. But, um, Mike, thanks for coming on. Thanks for doing the podcast. I know you got a baby at home. I got a baby at home. Sounds like you got a hungry dog or a sad dog or mad or happy. Um, yep. But we're juggling um, uh, three dogs and a and a child right now. So. I know that's uh that's a lot. That's a lot going on. Um, for those of y'all here on the podcast, my wife and I, we just we just uh, finished our second interview process for we're getting a new bird dog. So um, it's a really awesome breeder out of Raleigh. Um, and we're excited. It's going to be a wire hair pointing your fawn that we should have in November. So um, it's been uh, fun to kind of, you know, get excited about a, a new dog. So, but that is, yeah, if y'all can't tell, uh, I don't know, probably some, but not, uh, <laughs> that sea duck hunting is uh, pretty rough on a dog. It's, you know, being out there and a lot, a lot of what I've heard is those, those, uh, cause I've never sea duck hunting with a dog, but they really struggle to find the birds you know, once they're, once they jump from the boat into the water and the swell and shop and whatnot, uh, mm -hmm. it's just deep water. There's a lot going on out there, you know? So, uh, we'll see if the dog's got the drive and wants to do it. I'll definitely do it, but it's not going to be something I'm like, you know, dead set on. Um, yeah. But if y'all can't tell, I'm very, very tired, very exhausted. We usually try to do 45 minutes to an hour. We're at about 40 minutes. Um, so I do apologize. This podcast is a little bit shorter, but as always, we love y'all. Thank you for your, for your support. And we will see y'all next week. Later.